and we looked at um, Matthew 16 and um, how uh, when Peter recognizes, you know, Jesus, says, who do you say that I am? And he says, you're the son of, son of God, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And then Jesus says, um, on this rock, I will build my church. And we know that he's talking about this revelation, this divine revelation um, that Peter's received. And uh, so we started to talk about what that means and how as the church, our greatest responsibility is to receive the revelation of Jesus Christ, to allow that revelation to transform us and everything that we do in the life of the church to be built on that one thing. And uh, I was saying to my mom and, and a few of us who met this morning, I was just saying, um, you know, it's as simple as enthroning Jesus, because when you lift Jesus up, then he draws all men unto himself. And the power of the gospel begins to uh, become demonstrated and, and, and tangible um, in what you're doing. And so enthroning Jesus in our lives, enthroning Jesus in our community, lifting him up, exalting him, encountering him, magnifying him. Um, I know we, we sing lots of songs about it. And and I'm sure every single one of us know this language, but what that looks like in our lives actually is how we prepare ourselves to be a place of habitation and not just to live from one visitation to another. Um, there's nothing wrong with visitation. I just want to say that tonight before we pray and, and really dive in. There's nothing wrong with visitation. Visitation is beautiful. And even in the midst of habitation, there will be visitation of greater depths and levels as he invites you into more. So even if, if you're living in the realm of, of habitation where God is, is, is dwelling in your life and the manifest presence of God is expressed and you're living in that, he always is inviting us, taking us deeper. And there's, there's moments with him where uh, he invites us and, and, and draws us into that. So I, I just want us to make that clear. Visitation is not a bad thing, but there's more. And God doesn't want us to live empty and just live from moment to moment. He wants us to live in a constant experience and flow of his presence and his power in our lives. That's where transformation takes place. And, and just so you know, it brings such freedom. That's how he builds his church. He actually builds his church by being in all and filling in all through all. So he, he wants to fill you individually. And by filling you individually, he's beginning to fill his whole body. And as he begins to fill his whole body, we all come together in his fullness and we become this beautiful, diverse picture of the manifest fullness of Jesus Christ on the earth. And so really um, building the church has nothing to do with fancy institution structures and organizations. It has to do with getting God in people and seeing the fullness of him uh, in people coming together in the same locations in the same cities and countries and regions and, and watching how people who are filled with God begin to bring heaven to earth. And um, so I feel like where we're, where we're heading as a people is um, I felt as I was praying just this afternoon that there's such a huge shift that's happening right now on the earth, such a, a huge transition and a turning. I just see this, this turning of, of seasons and tides and um, there's just, there's something new that the Lord's taking us into and it, it requires new thinking, a new way, um, and I was saying to the Lord, you know, we've been talking about this for years and years and years, you know, about being positioned and about transition and, and all these things that the Lord's doing. And he just reminded me that when you read biblically, the Lord would sometimes take decades to prepare people for what he was taking them into. Um, you know, just look no further than Jesus, 30 years without doing any of the crazy stuff, but, but becoming a life that's prepared for the habitation of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I believe the Lord's been doing that in 24-7 since our, our birth as a church, that he's been preparing us and positioning us. And that's why we've, we've never really escaped that language. And, and maybe you felt like, wow, I feel like we just keep coming back to that. But it's because we've been formed uh, through the seasons and through the things that the Lord's been doing and building us for the time that we're coming into. So I want to encourage you with that and actually just say that um, when we talk about this stuff, it's not just repetition. It's actually that the Lord has been doing this for a long time in our hearts because the, what, the glory that's coming on the church is, is a real weighty end time harvest glory. Um, and it requires a people of his presence to carry it. Just a quick thing with that. Um, you know, David was so passionate about the presence of the Lord, but when he tried to um, facilitate and steward the presence of the Lord in his own strength, he put the Ark of the Covenant on a, um, a wagon and they tried to, to uh, 
force it and push it along to a specific location when the presence of the Lord was meant to be carried on the shoulders of the, of the Levites. And, um, and so this is important that our job is not to push and force and manufacture something and try and get God to move in a certain way uh, as a church. But our, our role is to prepare our lives as hosts, as carriers of his presence. Because when you do that, then we begin to move in his will. We begin to move in his power um, as he begins to reveal himself in a greater measure. So I do feel um, that we're coming into a time of really, really encountering and learning more about his presence, about his power, and about his anointing. I really do feel that we're going to see the anointing of God on his people, not just one or two, but actually his anointing on a body uh, to do his will and to do the work of the kingdom. So we're going to just pray real quick. You can stretch your hands out to me. I'm praying mainly for me because I want the Lord to, to speak to us tonight. And then we're going to jump in. Awesome. If you're not stretching your hands out, I'm just going to trust that you are in your heart. <laughs> so lord we just thank you so much for your presence lord I, I thank you that your power is made perfect in our weakness and lord i just come tonight and i yield myself to you and i know i have i have no words of of impact other than what you put in my heart and in my soul and in my mouth and i ask that you fill me tonight that you govern my words um and i pray that i'd speak from a place of overflow with you from a place of abiding and not a place um, of, of tiredness or, or flesh or anything like that, but that really, Lord, you'd come and minister to us tonight. And I pray that every single one of us, including myself, that we come away from this just filled and refreshed and, and full of life and full of hope, full of vision. And more than anything, that we come away with a hunger for your presence. And so, Lord, we ask tonight, come and fill us afresh. Come and touch us. Come refresh us. Come revive us, Lord. Thank you for your presence and your anointing that's on us tonight to do what you've called us to do. I bless you tonight, Holy Spirit. I honor your voice. I honor your word. I honor you as the highest authority in this church, in our lives, in every family, in every home that's participating tonight. And so, Father, we glorify you. We enthrone you tonight in this um, time that we have together. So we love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Okay, so I'm just going to give you the context of where I'm speaking from. <laughs> I think in two days, I've had four and a half hours of sleep. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we've, we've moved house. Uh, we're here at the farmhouse at the venue. Um, and uh, it's, it took a few days to get everything in. Then I also um, got excited and, and got a rooster. And uh, he was not very comfortable. <laughs> so he uh he's been going absolutely ape for two nights in a row crowing from 12 a.m non-stop until 6 a.m in the morning um and he's literally outside the bedroom window so so that was awesome um <laughs> it was uh yeah I, I really love chickens but it's probably not working here <laughs> so four and a half hours of sleep um i have been exposed to the the world's uh, systems. Uh, I won't mention service providers and things that I've <laughs> been dealing with on the phone uh, with real life stuff uh, and all the skullduggery and the nonsense that goes on out there. Um, but it's just been, it's been really an eye opener just to see how broken, messed up and evil the world is without Jesus. Um, and so it's been a, a pretty intense couple of days. But what's amazing is that in that <laughs> Uh, Courtney's laughing because she's also delirious. She's also <laughs> slept for about two hours. Um, but uh, what's amazing is I, I really felt um, today just such a, a reminder of um, the faithfulness and the tenderness and the love of the Father um, mm -hmm. and what it means to be his children, what it means to be a son and a daughter. And I, I want to start off by saying this. I, I want to talk tonight about abiding um, and about remaining in him. And uh, I just want to say this from the outset, that abiding in him is not about having your life figured out spiritually so that you feel adequate enough to spend um, time with him. Or if you haven't you know, had time in your day to spend hours and hours and hours with him, then you feel like you're disconnected, not a part of what he's doing. You feel dry and, uh, and you feel like you're constantly working towards the goal of abiding in him. 
Um, that, that is, that's really not what Jesus was talking about uh, in John 15 and in some of the scriptures we're going to read um, t- tonight. Uh, actually, abiding in Jesus is for the weak. Um, and what I mean by that is this. It's, it's, it's in your weakness that is his, um, his power is manifested and, and made perfect um, in our lives. And so when he calls us to abide in him, he's not calling you to have it all figured out. He's just calling you to come and yield and surrender. And uh, we're going to go to John 15 in a bit, but I just want to say this, that um, we, were, we were chatting about this this morning um, with my mom and, and Sal, and, uh, and just saying, you know, the, the, the pressure to produce fruit is not what Jesus was putting on us in John 15. He was giving us a promise that those who abide in him, who remain in him, will produce fruit. It was a promise of his work in us. And, uh, and so fruit, the fruit of the gospel in our lives is actually not something that the Lord has called us to focus on. It's actually something he's asked us to expect when we live in relationship uh, and intimacy with him. So what we're going to do is we're going to work towards John 15, but let's go where we ended last week. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll start there, and we'll move our way um, to John 15. So 2 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to read from the Amplified, and we'll just read it from from verse 1, and we're going to read all the way to verse 21. Okay, so it's quite a bit of reading, but it's good. It's the Word. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received and possessed by God's will a precious faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God, and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the true intimate knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. For his divine power has bestowed on us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through true and personal knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these Uh, He has bestowed on us his precious and magnificent promises of inexpressible value so that by them you may escape from the immoral freedom that is in the world because of disreputable desire and become sharers of the divine nature. It's very clear in those scriptures as we read last week that God's given us everything that we need to participate, to become partakers of the divine nature that Jesus has given to us. It says, for this very reason, applying your diligence to the divine promises, make every effort in exercising your faith to develop moral excellence, and in moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, steadfastness, and in your steadfastness, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly affection, and in your brotherly affection, develop Christian love, that is, learn to love unselfishly and seek the best for others, and to do things for their benefit. For as these qualities are yours and are increasing in you as you grow towards spiritual maturity, they will keep you from being useless and unproductive in regard to the true knowledge and greater understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, closing his spiritual eyes to the truth, having become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, believers, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Um, For by doing these things, actively developing these virtues, you will never stumble in your spiritual growth and will live a life that leads others away from sin. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly provided to you. Therefore, I love this. This is Peter. He's making it real clear and important here. He says, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and are established in the truth, which is held firmly in your grasp. I think it right, as long as I'm in this earthly tent, to inspire you by reminding you, knowing that the laying aside of this earthly tent of mine is imminent, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Moreover, I will diligently endeavor to see to it that even after my departure, you will be able at all times to call these things to mind. Verse 16. But we did not follow cleverly devised stories or myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he was invested with honor... 
and the radiance of the Shekinah glory from God the Father, such a voice as this came to him from the majestic glory, um, saying, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased and delighted. And we actually heard this voice made from heaven uh, when we were together with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more certain. You do well to pay close attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and light breaks through the gloom and the morning star arises in your hearts. But understand this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of or comes from one's personal or special interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. I love what Peter is saying at the end here. There's so much in this, but the one thing that was so clear to me is he's saying, uh, we have this prophetic word made more certain. He's saying the prophets of old prophesied Jesus. There's, there's knowledge about Jesus. There's, there's information about what he was going to do and how he was going to come. But what he's saying is, I've encountered the majesty. I've seen it. I'm an eyewitness. I've experienced his presence. I've been in his glory. I've heard the Father speak over the Son. I was in the, the environment of his glory, and I experienced and heard his voice for myself, which makes the prophetic word certain. And I want to encourage you tonight that don't be in a place now in this season where you're building your walk with the Lord on other people's experiences or stories or encounters. Like he says, we didn't follow cleverly devised stories or myths. Uh, Peter's saying what, what, the reason why we are like we are is because we have encountered Jesus. It's not just about the stories that we've heard of people uh, you know, sharing or preaching about him. We've actually seen him. We've heard the voice of God. We, we've, we're a people of encounter. And so I want to encourage you that in the season we're going into, it's not just about hearing great sermons that give you more information about Jesus. It's about an encounter with the man, Jesus Christ, because it's that that will lead you to a life that yes. burns for him until the very day that you leave this world and you will continue to burn for him in eternity. And so I love this, this chapter in 2 Peter. I love that he's saying to us that you've been given everything through Jesus to be, to be a partaker of the divine nature. And, and then he lists what that looks like and that there's expectations of the fruit as we mature and as we grow uh, uh, in relationship and intimacy with him, that we'll begin to see the maturity of this nature formed in us and through us. Um, and it's actually a demonstration um, of... of the, the divine will of God for the Christian. Then I want to jump from there to John 15. Um, and in this context, let's read what Jesus says. We're just going to read John 15, uh, verse 1 to verse 11. Okay. <laughs> he says this. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that continues to bear fruit, he repeatedly prunes, so that it will bear more fruit, even richer and finer fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have given you, the teachings which I've discussed with you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit by itself without remaining in the vine, neither can you bear fruit producing evidence of your faith unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. That's a statement. That's a promise. That's what he's speaking over us. For otherwise, apart from me, that is cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. He doesn't say you can't do anything. He says you can do nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, I, I, I like reading it in this context. You can actually do stuff. It's just that it's nothing. It doesn't, it has no impact. It has no eternal worth or value. But when you are abiding in the vine and you're, you're remaining in, in this divine nature, when you're remaining in the life that he's giving you, then what you do actually has eternal impact and value. Verse six, if anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out like a, bro uh, a broken off branch and withers and dies. And they gather such branches and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified and honored by this when you bear much fruit and prove yourselves 
to be my true disciples. Uh, I love that there because what he's saying is he, he's, not, he's not putting a challenge on us to say, are you bearing fruit to prove yourself as my true disciple? What he's saying is actually in the context of abiding, if you're remaining in me and living in this intimacy, the expectation is the promise that he gave in verse five, which is that um, if you abide in, or if you remain in him, you will bear fruit. And as you begin to do that, it proves to others around you that you're a true disciple of Jesus because the marks and the evidence of his life is seen in you. And it's not something that you're working really hard to achieve. It's something that's flowing through your life because you're connected to the vine. And it's real important. I know we've heard so many sermons on this, but it's really, really important that we understand this. And I, I want to talk about abiding and about rest um, as we go further. So verse 9, it says, I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love and do not doubt my love for you. If you keep my commandments and obey my teaching, you'll remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in His love. The way I read that and understand it is this. Keeping His commandments and obeying His teaching is the fruit of remaining in His love. And so if you do that in the same way that Jesus did, you'll see the evidence of what it means to remain in His love. Okay? Verse 11, I love this. I have told you these things so that my joy and delight may be in you, and that your joy may be made full and complete and overflowing. Jesus kind of begins to transition here, but he, he wraps up all the verses and, and the things he's just said with joy. And he actually, what he's saying is, this abiding thing that I'm calling you into, this remaining in me, is actually going to produce a joy in you that is full, complete, and overflowing. So abiding is not this uh, exhausting, difficult thing that we're trying to attain or something that we're walking uh, uh, towards. It's actually the starting point of the Christian life. And anything that we do as believers outside of this posture of remaining in Him is nothing. We can do nothing outside of Him. And so He's saying actually that you're going to find joy, a complete, full, and overflowing joy in the simple reality of what it means to abide. And uh, I was just thinking about this this afternoon, and I got so just touched and, and blessed by the Lord because I realized that, you know, trusting, trusting in the Lord, um, you know, faith is, is, the, is an action of trust. You, you, you can't actually have faith in the Lord without trusting the Lord. And so faith is an action of trust, but rest is the manifestation or, or the revealing of trust. And so you'll see somebody who's moving in rest, who's, who's living in a place of rest, you can see the evidence of their trust. You can see the evidence of their abiding and remaining in the Lord. And so resting in Him, resting in His presence is evidence of abiding. And that's why what I love about looking at the life of Jesus is that He, he was so intentional about creating a life that is positioned to always be a host and a carrier of His presence, a, a, a life where, where Holy Spirit can inhabit and remain and dwell. And everything that He did was about being aware and listening and being obedient to the Lord. And I look at this life and it, it's so abstract to the world. It's so abstract to society. The worries and the stresses and the cares of this world that, that squeeze everybody's lives. It's like Jesus was larger than life. He was he was just not entangled and, and, and uh, stuck in these things. And it's not because, you know, hey, well, it's Jesus. He did everything as a man so that we could walk in the same life. So what did Jesus learn and understand about relationship with the Lord that he's inviting us into? What did he understand about being a man living in the divine nature of God that he's inviting and drawing us into? And I believe that it's this simple, simple truth. It's that as we abide in him, we learn to yield, we learn to surrender, which is not a passive act. It's actually, a, it's very active. It's very front-footed, but it's a rest that produces fruit in our lives at a rate that we could never do ourselves. And so the most fruitful people in the kingdom are actually people who know how to abide, who know how to live and remain in His presence. And where we're going as a church, I believe, is, is a time of fruitfulness like we've never known, a, a, a momentum and a, an, an acceleration to what God's called us to do. That's not going to come from our efforts or our work. It's going to come from abiding. 
It's going to come from us as a community learning how to host his presence, learning how to steward what's inside of us and allowing Jesus to do the work in our hearts that produces the fruit of his divine nature. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? I know, I know we've heard so many, uh, you know, teachings on this, but I, I really, I was so encouraged this afternoon because it just takes, it just takes a few moments in the middle of, of the craziness of this world that we live in to turn your affection towards the Lord. And as you turn your affection towards him, your awareness of him grows. And as your awareness of him grows, you find a rest that comes over your soul that is supernatural. I can't explain it to you. This afternoon, I was absolutely exhausted. I thought I was going to fall over. And uh, I was so tired that I couldn't even nap. I don't know if you've ever had, had that where you're so tired that you don't even know how to function. You don't even know how to close your eyes and go to sleep. It's like, and, and I just decided I, I couldn't sleep or fall asleep. So I was just going to just rest and just receive. And all I did was turn my affection towards the Lord. And he comes. And what I mean by that is this, it's not, I know he's with me, but the, the tangible presence of the Lord comes upon us. And as he comes upon us, he brings a rest for our souls. And it's a certainty and assurance that we cannot find anywhere else in the midst of, of life circumstances, in the midst of a global pandemic and fear and all the stuff that wants to come against us. There is a, a confidence that comes on us as we rest, as we abide, as we remain in him. And you know, it's so funny. He changed my perspective on the whole situation that I've been in, in a moment, because all he did was he took my focus, what I was giving my attention to, he shifted that, put it back on the majesty of Jesus, like Peter spoke about, actually encountering him. And when that happened, I felt this lift of all the stuff that, that we had been, you know, trying to deal with over the last couple of days. And as that, that, that thing lifted, that pressure it was like, wow, I felt rejuvenated, rested, and just so tender in his presence. And um, I want to say this, that I was reading a, a 2 Kings chapter 6 just now, just before we started, where, um, you know, Elisha, they, they come after Elisha, and they surround the city. And um, I, I was just so rocked by this, because here's a man who, there's a whole army after him. They want to kill him. They're upset with Elisha, and they, they are, they, they're after his life. And Elisha's there with his servant and his servant wakes up early and he goes outside and he looks up over on the hills and he sees this army that's coming for them and he panics. And it's like, there's no way out of this. There's, you can't control the situation. You can't, there's no solution yet. You don't figure this out. You're surrounded. The city's surrounded. These guys are going to come in and take us out. And, uh, and Elisha says to him, do not be afraid. That's how he starts it off. And I, there's so much of scripture. Jesus says it so many times to his disciples. He, he keeps speaking to them. Do not be afraid. And I'll tell you why. It's because there is one thing that the enemy has been using since the beginning of time to manipulate and control uh, the people of God. And it's fear. And if he can get you to be afraid and if he can get you to put your attention on, on what he's doing, you will miss the bigness of what God's doing in that moment. And in, in that second, you can actually... Uh, uh, pull away from a divine encounter that draws you deeper into knowledge of him and you begin to focus and, and, and emphasize the enemy and what you find is you're drifting further and further away from an awareness of his presence you might be on the other side of the room and know God's here somewhere but I don't really know uh, or I'm not facing him. I can't see him I don't really know what he's doing and I think so many Christians are in that place. It's like you're standing in the room of, of chaos and you know God's in the room somewhere, but you're not quite sure what he's doing, what he's saying, or what's actually happening because you're, you're kind of aware of him, but you're not actually beholding him. And, um, and so in this, in 2 Kings chapter 6, it's amazing that he says, he asked the Lord to open his servant's eyes. And the Lord, I love that Elisha has that kind of relationship with the Lord. And we saw it right now in John 15, that actually when we're abiding in him, we can ask anything and he does it for us. And so here's Elisha and he says, Lord, would you open the eyes of my servant to see? And he opens, the Lord opens his eyes and he begins to see chariots and, and, and uh, ministers, angels of fire surrounding him. And I, I get so stirred by that because those that abide in him, those that walk in intimate relationship with Jesus, we are protected and surrounded 
by armies, heavenly armies of fire. Nothing can touch us or come against us. And so you're, right now we are positioned as the church surrounded by the enemy's armies of COVID-19 and all the fear and destruction that this global pandemic has brought, the corruption of governments and leadership and all these things, the pressures, they're all screaming at you from every direction and they're demanding your attention and they're trying to put fear in your heart and they're trying to change your perspective of what you see and, and, and they're also trying to change or, or, or cause you to forget who you're with. That actually, just like Elisha the prophet was there with the servant, that actually Jesus, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's with us. He's standing alongside us. He's directing us, leading us, guiding us. But the enemy wants to cause you to forget who you're actually with, regardless of the fact that you're surrounded by enemy forces. And I feel like tonight what the Lord wants to do is he wants to open our eyes to see that those that are for us, are so much greater and so much more than that which is against us. And I love the fact that it's armies, heavenly armies of fire. Because I I promise you, I've been asking the Lord uh, this afternoon, I want to see that. I want to see what that looks like. Because I guarantee you, when that servant saw these fiery, uh, you know, ministers of heaven, these warriors of heaven, I'm telling you, something shifted in his heart and there was a confidence. And what's so beautiful is Elisha actually prays that the Lord would blind the enemy and he leads them to another location uh, and then the Lord opens their eyes again. I just, I think it is so powerful that we as the people of God have that kind of authority over the enemy and we forget that. And, and, and I believe there's a divine link with abiding and resting in his presence and operating in power and authority like we've never known or seen before as the church. Forgetting, you know, we forget this, that, that, Elisha's operating in an old covenant. He didn't even have the Holy Spirit inside of him. And now here we are with the very presence of God, not just upon us, but dwelling within us. And God's asking us that if we will abide and if we will turn our attention and our focus towards him and behold his majesty, that we will operate in power and authority like never seen before. And that the church has the answer and the power to shift and change and transition an entire global pandemic back onto the front foot for the kingdom of God, the greatest harvest that the world has ever seen. And so I don't want to disconnect abiding and resting in the presence of the Lord from the most effective end time harvest that the world has ever seen, because I believe that they're linked. I believe that there's a rest that is coming on the church, a confidence in the ability and the divine strength of God that's made perfect in our weakness. And as we rest in that, as we learn to be aware and obedient, then we're going to see the fruits of the gospel expressed through our lives. So I want to encourage you. I've been sharing it, but I just want to go over that again. I feel to just backtrack a little bit here. Um, how, how do we grow in our awareness? We grow in our awareness by turning our affections towards the Lord. When we turn our affection towards him, the more we look at him and love him and take the time to focus our lives in the direction of his glory and his presence and his face, We become more and more aware of who he is. And the more you become aware of who he is, the less fear has a say in your life because you're taken by the glory and majesty of the King of Kings, the creator of all. And suddenly your problems become so small in comparison to this beautiful King of glory. And and I know this is so simple, but I promise you it's actually the key. Um, I love in in Psalm 16, um, David talks about, Um, that you show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. It's a very strong statement. You show me the path of life. He's basically saying, I found the secret. I found the key to life, to living. And it's his presence because in his presence is fullness of joy. It's not fullness of laughter or fullness of, you know, giddiness or just being, you know, uh, you know, crazy. No, it's fullness of joy which is actually, I I believe joy is actually a place of eternal rest. That when you're you're in the realm of joy, you are completely at rest. You are completely satisfied and fulfilled in Him. And you begin to bubble up and overflow in this glory and in His presence. And so this afternoon, I was just so touched by the Lord as He began to remind me. He was saying, you know, Connor, I'm not asking you, uh, you know, when you're going through a, 
a, a busy time. There's lots of things happening and, and it's a bit crazy. I'm not asking you to try and carve out something in the middle of that for me. You know, we use this language like I need to carve out time for God and so that I can stay in, in the right place with him. And, and actually was saying to me, Con, I want to teach you about abiding. And it's just, it's funny that um, Gavin gave me a, a book um, for as an ordination present, which is Andrew Murray's book, Abide in Christ. And I haven't even read it yet, but the Lord led me uh, to one, one page. Uh, he told me to go to page 28. I open it and, and everything that I'm talking about now, Andrew Murray addresses about weakness. And he says, weakness doesn't disqualify you uh, from abiding. It actually qualifies you. It's like, why? the reason we need to abide is because of our weakness. We actually, we, we, we know in and of ourselves, we have nothing to give, nothing to offer. So just abide, just surrender, just yield. Rest in his glory, rest in his presence. Because even your obedience is going to flow from that place. I feel like, you know, there's going to be things the Lord's going to ask us to do in this next season that require um, radical obedience. And it's not going to be radical obedience that comes from radical gifting. <laughs> it's going to be radical obedience that comes from encounters. It's going to be radical obedience that comes from resting in his presence, from knowing what it's like to operate from this place of the abundance of God. And, and I include that in finances. I know we, we've wrapped up that series, but I've been so touched by the fact that in Philippians, Paul actually says that, that God will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. It is an unlimited resource in the kingdom. Provi the provision of God is unlimited. And how would we live our lives in the kingdom if we understood that and if we were abiding in the divine nature and knowing that we have access to that all the time? And so the, the, the life of the kingdom becomes such a joy because it's, I want to say it like this, it's not easy, but there is an ease to it. There's a rest to it um, because it's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life that's developing uh, the fruit that people are going to taste and receive the seed of the gospel that then begins to grow and mature them and produce fruit. Again, this is how we reproduce. We reproduce by abiding. Um, is this making sense? Just give me some thumbs up or... Yeah. So, so where we're going as a church, um, I, I believe the Lord's going to touch us in, as a community like we've never experienced before. Um, and, and he's going to do that deep work of deliverance and setting free. But there's such a purpose to that. Um, it's not just a season of encounter. He wants to actually form a culture and a way of life that is built on 24-7 encounters with the King of Glory and to see 24-7 church built on the revelation of his son. And I've been so challenged by this that, that the more I look at Jesus, the more about him I realize I don't know. And the more I look at him and ask for his heart, the more I'm challenged and I begin to receive his love for people. And um, I love what my dad was sharing on, on Sunday about what happened um, with our, our gardener who was, you know, he was uh, mugged and they took his stuff and, you know, the natural earthly response is anger and you want to go after them. And, um, but actually the Lord in that moment, in the middle of, of pain, he wants to show you what abiding looks like. He wants to minister to you. He wants, he wants to bring you the divine perspective of his life, his nature and his, his vision. And what it does is it opens your heart way beyond your natural capacity to love. And it's only when we abide and rest in his presence that, that the love of God doesn't just touch you personally, but it expands your capacity to love others. And what you once saw as evil and horrible and ugly, you begin to see the lost and the brokenness of these people. And your heart begins to long and burn uh, for them. And, and, and it's the same thing with nations. You know, we pray the prayer, Lord, give us your heart. And I, I'm learning more and more that the way he teaches us about his heart is he begins to show you about people and places and regions that you don't even know of. You've never even had a care in your heart or mind about those places. And he begins to show you what he cares about. And that's how he enlarges your heart to love. He teaches you what love lived out actually means. He teaches you what it looks like to carry the mandate and the mission of Jesus Christ on the earth. And, and I, I'm linking all of this together tonight to say this, that what the Lord has given us uh, through Jesus is everything that we need to become this. 
And we've got to change our, our perspective. I know, I, I know in 24 seven, and I include myself, that we, we're a people who we so long for the full potential of what Jesus paid for. We want to walk uh, in the, in the, the perfect uh, life that Jesus uh, has modeled and given to us. And, and I don't think there's a single person who wouldn't say, I really want that. But I think the disconnect has been, we see it as a goal that we're trying to get towards. And I know we've preached on these things for years and years, but it, this is how deeply entrenched the lie of the enemy has been in the people of God that we still think we are trying to get towards this goal, this, this achievement of, of, of um, abiding and remaining and, and living in this constant place. But I'm learning more and more that it's not so much about whether you think you're there or not. It's simply about yielding. It's simply about surrendering. It's simply about turning your affection towards the Lord in the middle of what you're going through. Because it's this, it's this simple and this amazing that you can be in the most difficult circumstance and situation. And if you can learn to do one thing in your life, pause, stop. Silence the rush, silence the craziness just for a moment and turn your affection towards the Lord and behold Jesus. And as you begin to do that in, in that moment, Jesus becomes larger than anything else in your life. And he begins to fill your vision, fill your view. And literally within seconds, he can completely transform your perspective and your heart attitude towards the circumstance simply because you looked. You took a moment to stop and look at him. And, and I, I'm learning this, uh, you know, there's a couple of things that we're facing and having to deal with that are practical things that are, you know, not nice, but I'm learning this. You can get so caught up in that. And I, I found myself being controlled and manipulated by fear because the, the system of the world is to, to use fear of not having enough or fear of being punished or fear of, of somebody nailing you or your reputation or this or that, or all these different things or your credit score or your whatever it is trying to nail you, trying to, to cause you to act out of a place of fear, to react to something that's, that's come against you. And as the people of God, what we're called to do is to stop, to pause, to behold Jesus, and to understand that we have divine access to the solutions of heaven that we can now begin to release on the earth. Because there is no problem too big for heaven. There is no uh, failure or disappointment or struggle or whatever it is that you're facing that's too big for heaven. Actually, what he's asking you to do is he's saying everything that you need is found in the Son. It's found in Jesus. And I love what he says in 2 Peter that actually when, when we begin to behold and experience him, there's a light that begins to dawn in our hearts. The morning star begins to rise in our hearts and he illuminates all the spaces of your life. And it's the light of his presence that begins to penetrate and permeate and, and begin to drive out the dark spaces where fear has tried to find a home. He, the light of his presence begins to remove those places. And then what happens is he begins to inhabit and the habitation of his presence fills your emotions, your desires, your soul realm actually begins to rest in him and suddenly you begin to look abstract and different to the world around you because everybody's panicking but you're manifesting jesus in the middle of confusion and chaos and pain because you know him and you know that he's for you and he loves you and his hand is on your life and his anointing is on your life and he will never let you go and and in the midst of all of this craziness he will speak to you and he'll lead you and he'll guide you and all he's asking for is for you to stop, for you to pause, and for you to lift your gaze and behold the sun. And I, I, I'm so moved uh, in this time, just the simplicity of the word, the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of his presence. But as we yield to him, as we yield and as we surrender and as we learn how to receive I remember saying this once, I said, you can only become in the Christian life what you've received. We cannot become anything in our walk with the Lord that we haven't received from him. But we turn off our receivers when we begin to look at the things that cause fear, when we take our eyes off of the sun, when we take our eyes off of Jesus, and we try to build parts of our lives on the systems of this world, on the cares of this world, and not on the revelation of Jesus. And, and I, I love this, that he's built, Jesus is building his church, but he's building it on the revelation of himself, the revelation of the Son of God. 
And, and, and if I, you know, the church is not, it's not Sunday morning. It's not our get together. The church is us as the people of God coming into the head, coming into Christ and beginning to be, to be, to move as one and to be joined together as one. And so the more that I fall in love with Jesus, the more I fall in love with people. And the more I fall in love with his heart, the more I understand his bride. And the question that begins to rise in my heart is not, Lord, what is the church going to do for me in this season? Or, you know, what are you saying directionally for the church in terms of success and people and, and growth? Actually, my heart is, Lord, what do you want from your bride in this season? What do you want? What, what's the desire of your heart from your church in this season? And I believe that there's a, there's a new breed of leaders coming through in this season that will, will have that question before them as they lead uh, the movement of God on the earth. And it's going to be that simple. Jesus, what would you have us do? Jesus, what do you want from your people? What, what are you asking of us in this time? Because you know what I love about the Lord is he never sees things the way that we see them here on the earth. You know, we can look at this situation and think the pressure's on the church now to show up. And it's, you know, hey, the church should be speaking now. The church's voice should be actually loud and speaking into all these things. And it's a, it is a fleshly, earthly perspective. And I promise you that there's been a pressure on the prophets in this season to have the next word of the Lord and direction on this and that and whatever. And there's just so much chaos and confusion because every prophet and his dog has a word of, you know, <laughs> that's supposed to shape the next. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not knocking this, you know, I, I I love the prophetic. I love prophets. I love the, the word of the Lord. But I believe that if we were just to simplify everything to the one question of, Lord, what do you want? What's on your heart right now? I promise you, he would astound us with the simplicity of his desires. See, because God's moved by things that, that, that sometimes we don't even pay attention to. You know, sometimes the Lord's just moved by compassion and he's just moved by just small acts of obedience. And he's moved by the fact that his people are still gathering in the midst of this. And I'm not talking about a victim back, backfooted mentality. I believe the line of Judah is roaring and we're going to see the fruit of the gospel. We're going to see salvation, signs, wonders, miracles. But what I want to encourage us with is this, that those, those things that we have as expectations are the fruit of a people that know how to abide. And I think it's abiding and remaining in him that pleases his heart most because it's on the Tuesday morning or tomorrow morning, Thursday morning or Friday morning when nobody's around and you don't have to put on this big performance of signs, wonders, power, prophetic words, ministry, praying out loud, all these things that are beautiful in their place. But when nobody's looking and it's just you and him, what's the posture of your heart? What's the reality of your life with him? What's the reality of your walk with Jesus? When nobody's around, do you know how to abide? Because what I find incredible about Jesus is he kept retreating and going into a place of solitude, but he didn't make solitude and isolation the formula of abiding. See, this is what's so beautiful is, is you can be in the, the busiest season of your life where you might not even find time to be alone. But it's in the midst of that that he wants to teach you how to, how to do life, how to live this life with him and in him. And actually that it, it's, it's in that place, in the, in the abiding, in the remaining, in the resting, that he begins to prune it and produce fruit. And what happens is that kind of church, that kind of body will begin to see fruit that they did not see coming. And that's what's going to shock the world. And that's what's going to confirm to the world actually what the Lord's doing in this time is that there'll be things that come out of our lives in this coming season that we did not anticipate, that we did not expect. And I want to encourage you to enlarge your vision, to enlarge your vision and to say, Lord, I, I know that I might have these expectations on what I think it's going to look like. And I want to see those things. You know, I want to see the dead raised. I want to see people healed. And, and I, I'm going after that with everything, but I, I'm not capping it there. I have to say, Lord, when I make you my vision, then I know that there's going to be things that, that happen in this season, things that come out of my life that I could never have even dreamed of, things that are way beyond my imagination. And that's when the people of God step into that wide open space of eternity, where the, the realm of eternity becomes real. And I, I, I sang it on Sunday. I really believe that, that the generation that's coming through is a generation of creatives. I, I can't remember who I was talking to about it, but I was just saying it's like, 
young people coming through now, everybody wants to do something creative. And even the apps uh, that are being created now, like TikTok and all these things that are going viral, it's all about being creative and expressing yourself. And there's this generation that are coming through with this longing. And I see it as a strength, but I see the need for the church to begin to model uh, abiding and remaining in him, resting in him, having identity that's found in the sun, what it means to be a true original of the kingdom. Because I think that actually we're going to see an expression of creativity in the church like we don't understand. It's not going to look like art as we know it. It's actually going to look like many different forms, many different things, fresh creative uh, responses and expressions from the church that are going to solve problems without us even knowing. Uh, I don't know if this is making sense. I'll try and I'll come back to the simple stuff. But I believe that there's going to be problem solving in the church without even the focus being problem solving, that you're going to be the answer to problems just by being who you are because you're abiding in, in, in the sun and he has heaven solutions. And, and do you know what's so beautiful about that is there's a confidence just by being you, that you, you walk into rooms and into situations and you're not expected to have this intellectual solution to what you face, but you know that what's inside of you is the solution. And so as long as you're just abiding and keeping your affection placed on him, that he's actually going to manifest himself. And that's when, you know, uh, the, the fragrance of the knowledge of him is released everywhere that we go. And, uh, and suddenly people find the answer to what they were looking for that's not even wrapped up in their question. You know, I, I feel like right now there's so many, uh, you know, questions and things that are coming around and situations that are difficult. And the, the answer isn't even in what they're asking. That, that what they're looking for in their hearts is a demonstration, a representation of somebody that knows why they exist and why they're here on the earth that carry and embody the reality of God in Christ, in man, the, the divine design, because every single one of us are longing and yearning for the, the Eden reality that's been brought into the new covenant, that's been taken way beyond the garden and brought into a kingdom. And as we begin to understand that, that that's the great longing of our heart, then abiding in him is the greatest joy. And it will produce a joy that is full, that is complete, and that is overflowing. Um, and when, when that becomes a reality in our lives, and it's a daily thing, don't get me wrong, every day it's an abiding in him so that these things become real in our hearts and lives. But as we do that individually and we come together as the body, Suddenly, there's this force of the movement of heaven on the earth that isn't us trying to push a wagon of his presence and, and try and get everybody to see that, hey, we're bringing the presence of the Lord into the city. No, actually, we're carrying his presence on our shoulders because that is the, the great design of God is that he, he always wanted his presence to be carried on the shoulders of his sons and daughters. And as we do that, what comes with his presence, what comes with the Shekinah glory of God is the transforming power of his love. And so we're going to see the world transformed and situations and things and people's lives transformed, not because we are about the mandate of transformation, but actually because we're a people of his presence. Mm -hmm. And where his presence is, then the love of God begins to lead people to repentance. It saves them, it heals them, it transforms them. So what I want to encourage you with is this isn't a new direction, just so that people know. This isn't a new direction or a new vision or a new, it's none of that. This is the simplicity of the gospel that's making the vision a reality in your life today and tomorrow and the next day and the day after that for as long as you live. Because you can have so much vision and you can see all the stuff that you want to walk in. But if you don't know how to abide today, then you haven't taken any steps forward into your destiny and into the call of God on your life. And so my encouragement is as we are going after this as a church and as a community, the expectation is, and I know I said it earlier, I'm saying it again, the expectation is power. The expectation is the fruit of the gospel, transforming people's lives, healing, signs, wonders, miracles. But it's coming from a people of his presence, not from a people that are trying hard because they feel an ungodly pressure to be something that they already are. And that's what's so important is that we already are something. We're just learning how to live in that. And that comes from abiding. It doesn't come from gifting or trying to find a space for, for your expression. Um, and that's what I was trying to say about the next generation. They're looking for approval. They're looking for validation of the expression of their lives. 
That's why there's these TikTok trends of some dance thing and everybody wants to do that dance and then, and then be validated for that, that dance or that move and, and be approved and for people to comment and like. And it's all coming out of this thing of actually they, they want a, a true and authentic expression of their life and they want somebody to approve it. But you'll never be secure or found in that until you abide in Jesus and find all your approval, acceptance and validation mm. from him. Because the expression that comes from your life then isn't yours anymore. It's the life of Jesus. And that's when 2 Peter chapter 1 becomes real. We're now divine. We're partakers of the divine nature. And the, the, those fruit that we read um, in 2 Peter 1 becomes real. And we're building on it every single day. And, that, and then it talks about entering into the kingdom of God. And it's not just salvation. It's entering into the realm of his kingdom where the domain of God is manifest in our lives. And that's when you can ask anything and he'll do it because you're in him. So good. Whew, man, I love Bible study nights. <laughs> this stuff, I just feel the presence of the Lord just comes on us and he wants to do so many things. And it's just, it's so simple. But can you feel, I don't know if you can feel it, but can you feel the pleasure of God when we talk like this? I, I, when I talk like this, I, it's just the simple heart of God and I feel his pleasure. <laughs> Cause he loves us and he, we're his kids and he, he wants to be with us. And you know, it's amazing. It's like, you are a world changer. You are a powerhouse for the kingdom, but you're a son and a daughter first. You're, <laughs> and, and even, even beyond that, as the church, we are the vehicle for revival. We are the, the force, the movement of God on the earth that's bringing his kingdom. But before that we're a bride. And at the end, when we stand before him, we'll stand before him as a bride. And yes, we will carry the rewards of the, 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 the fruit and the work of the kingdom that we've done in our lives. But as our, as in purity, as we stand before him, our hearts stand before him as a bride before the bridegroom. And, and I want to encourage us that, that when you begin to understand that, then abiding in him, relationship with him, intimacy with him, it is our greatest joy. It's everything that we live for. And, and I, I know I'll end with this. Heidi Baker, I love this quote. She always says this. She says, fruitfulness flows from intimacy. And, you know, I, I've heard that for years and years and years. And it's like, you just can't get away from it. You come back. You keep coming back. And I look at that woman's life for me just as such a testimony of somebody who's doing more than anybody else I know in the kingdom. But every time you hear her talk, she's talking about one thing, getting low, surrendering, yielding to him. Lord, what's on your heart? Who, what's, what have you got for me today? Who am I going to love today? What child have you put in my arms? Or what person am I called to feed? Or what dead person am I going to raise? Or all these different things, but it's coming from a lover's heart. And um, I think the Lord's bringing us back to that, to our first love, um, in a new way, in a fresh way. I believe he's always doing that. He's always bringing us back to first love. But in this season, to be a people of his presence is to be a people that love him uh, a bride that's for his glory. That's the title of my book. But a bride that's, that's for his glory and, and an end time bride that stands before him full of, of the fruits of the kingdom, but just extravagant in love and adoration for Jesus. And I believe that's what guys like Peter and Paul gave their lives for. Um, you know, when you study the first thousand years of the church, it's very interesting how quickly um, the church became institutional when the, the, the ones who understood what it meant to be lovers, when they passed away and died and it hadn't been reproduced, then suddenly the church became institutional and designed around structures and organizations. But when you see what the church was, was birthed and born in, it was birthed with this community of lovers, lovers of God that have given everything for him. And I believe the Lord's bringing us not back to that, back to those values, but he's taking us forward to the end time church, which is what these guys were actually dreaming of and, and believing uh, for. And it's a church that are lovers of God, but not just lovers, they are powerful lovers of God. They walk in the power of God. So I can, I can talk about this all night, so I, I'm not going to do that. Um, but maybe, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, we can, we can open it up and I'd love to, to hear um, from you, but I, I want to ask this. I know when we open up these times, um, something has changed. So don't approach Bible studies like we've approached them in the last couple of weeks. 
Um, I, I really feel such a strong sense of protecting the environment of his presence. And so I'm asking you before you say stuff to think about what you're going to say and honor, um, you know, his presence in your words. Um, and that's not a, a guilt, shame, condemnation, pressure thing. No, just be yourself. I'm, you know, you can relax. But I'm just asking you to think about it because as we do talk and share, um, I want to, to train us as a community and as we're training even myself uh, to recognize and honor his presence and to be thinking about that all the time and everything that we do. Um, because when you honor him and you're in humility, um, that's like the riverbanks for, his, for him to flow. And I, I get so excited about that. So, so we are going to open it up and I'd love to, to hear your thoughts or if there's something you want to ask or say or share, um, let's open that up and, and let's just do it together. Uh, sensitively. So you're welcome to unmute. In Jesus' name. Now you have to unmute. Somebody has to. I'll give it 10 seconds and then I'll pick on a leader. Debbie's trying to hide, so maybe she'll be first on the list. <laughs> awesome. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Okay, let's do this. Who who of you tonight have been feeling um and this is, this is a real question. This is, I, I've been feeling it the last two days and the Lord reminds us and ministers to us all the time. But who of you have been feeling just like life just got really intense in this season and, and the, the stuff around us just got really loud and maybe you feel like you've been in that place of you kind of are aware of the Lord in the room, but you, you haven't really known what he's doing, what he's saying. And, and what I've been sharing tonight about abiding, it's like that's the desire of your heart but maybe you've been approaching it as something that you're trying to achieve and get to. Um, and tonight, the Lord actually wants you to just make that adjustment of resting in Him, saying yes to Him, surrendering and yielding. Is there anybody that resonates or relates to what I've just said there over the last couple of weeks? Just, yeah, you can wave your hand just so that I know. Awesome. There's quite a few. Awesome. Cool. So it's not just me. Yay. <laughs> um, uh, I'm so encouraged at the simplicity of how the Lord works, that it's, it's so simple. You turn your affection and he comes. And so let's just go after that together. I believe that right now in this moment, that the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit is here in every single one of our rooms and homes to set us free from a striving and, and works uh, approach to our relationship and to teach us how to rest in him. And I feel like there's a lot of us that are tired you know, physically and emotionally and mentally tired. And, um, and I feel like, you know, for some of us in that tiredness, um, you know, we, we try to, you've tried to sleep or you've tried to take time to rest or, you, you know, physically rest and all these different things. And it's just not changing that feeling that you have. And I, it's because our souls are, are, are so preoccupied and, and filled with so much noise and chaos and even just um, feelings and emotions and pain that is so, it's real. Um, you know, you've journeyed stuff in the season. That's what I feel. There's people that have really, really carried some, some heavy things. And I feel tonight the rest of the Lord is going to come and revive and refresh and, and energize your souls. And there's going to be such a peace. And it's, it's a peace that surpasses your understanding. It's not understood here. It's, it's, it's experienced in your soul. And so if that's you, just receive this. Father, I just thank you for your grace and your mercy and your amazing love, Lord. I thank you that as we just turn our affection now, Lord, we, we know that there's been, it's been a crazy season. There's been a lot of noise. And Lord, we, we're, we're just turning our affection towards you tonight. We're turning our gaze. We're beholding you. And we're just saying, you're so beautiful. You're so worthy. You're so holy. You're so amazing. You're the great lover of my soul. And when I look at you, everything that I am is satisfied and fulfilled. When I look at you, the pain 
is no longer there. When I, when I behold you, I experience healing that washes over my soul, that washes over my body. When I look at you, I experience freedom from bondage, freedom from my struggles. When I look at you, I'm revived, I'm energized. My body begins to come alive again in your presence. And so tonight, Holy Spirit, I ask that you grab a hold of our gaze, that you captivate our attention so gently and so beautifully and so tenderly that it's not a, this violent, aggressive thing that you just, you grab our cheeks and you just turn our face and you say, look at me and you just begin to kiss us and love us and hold us close and, and the healing of your spirit begins to pour over us and the life the abundant Zoe life of God begins to flow over us, in us, and through us. So I thank you right now for the living waters, the refreshing waters of your presence to flow over us tonight. Lord, these are not just words, and I, I do ask that, that we hear beyond my words, but that we experience your touch tonight, that your anointing so gently just comes upon us. You're anointing to let things go, Lord. I feel like there's things tonight that you're asking us to let go, and it's a, there are difficult things to release. But your anointing, your enablement, your divine strength comes upon our weakness and enables us to release what you never asked us to hold. Father, I, I thank you that where we haven't had the capacity to forgive or to love, that you come now and you enlarge our capacity as we look at you, as we behold you, as we look at the marks in your hands and in your side and your feet. Lord, that your strength to forgive and to love comes and, and fills us right now. Lord, I just, I silence the thoughts and our thought life, the thinking I silence it. I just I pray a stillness that comes over our minds right now. And as your stillness comes over our minds, I thank you that you begin to replace the lies of fear and you bring a rest and a trust and a confidence in Jesus Christ and the revelation and encounter of who he is. And Lord, I ask tonight that if there's any of us that are just longing for that encounter, just longing for that experience of you and your, your fullness, Lord. I thank you tonight that you meet them. Not just a feeling, but a, a heart touch, a heart connection, a spirit-to-spirit, -spirit, deep to deep encounter that awakens them to your life, that awakens them to your voice. Lord, I ask that your tender presence your anointing and your glory, that it would increase over our lives individually, over our families, our marriages, our children, our businesses, over everything that we are, and that it would increase over 24-7 church. Lord, we have one desire and only one thing that we seek, one thing that we're about, and it's to enthrone you because we know that when we enthrone Jesus, we are fulfilling our very purpose and destiny in God. And not only that, but we will live in the benefits of your presence. So Lord, come and breathe over us tonight. Come and touch us. Come and fill us. I ask that you just go beyond my words now, Lord. I, I don't have the words anymore, but I ask that you just do the work that only you can do. I know that it's not in what I've said, but it's in your anointing power. Father, I just thank you for deep healing, soul healing, emotional healing that's happening tonight. Not a moment, but transformation. Not just a touch, but a complete, overwhelming uh, conquering of those areas of our lives, Lord, where you conquer us with your truth, conquer us with your love, and change those parts of our lives. In Jesus' name. Yeah, and I'm just grateful for you, Lord. I'm, I'm grateful for 
how real you are to us in, in our times of need. And we'll never stop needing you. We'll never stop uh, requiring your presence as our greatest need. But thank you that you never fail to completely, uh, not just meet us, but explode in our lives with your brilliance, your majesty, your glory, your faithfulness and goodness and kindness. I just ask that that would be real for us tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. If there's anything um, specific that any of our leaders are, are feeling to, you know, maybe mom and dad, if you've got something as well. I'm just feeling to share um, two scriptures. And it's maybe for someone on the screen here um, to do with sleep. And Psalm 4 verse 8 says, In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. So in peace, Lord, we lie down and sleep. For you alone make us dwell in safety. And Proverbs 3.24 says, When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Mm, beautiful. So maybe this can just uh, help someone as well. Um, it's just a shift that I've been um, trying to make just practically is um, when we read those scriptures, um, when we begin to pray and, and exercise our faith, often our faith is for something. If your faith is for something, in this particular case, I'm praying for peaceful sleep, I'm praying for good night's rest, um, then it's like you're coming from a place of lack, that you don't have something and you're praying for something, um, then whenever there's lack, that's when fear comes in because fear is, is that you don't have it. So he tries to control you as if you don't have something. So coming from that place, rather that I do have it. So when we pray, we pray, we say, thank you, Lord, for the incredible peace that you have given me, that when I put my head on the pillow and I close my eyes, I have such good sleep because my soul is at rest. My soul is, and this is what abiding is actually what, what God wants us to understand is that it's actually found in Christ. 
That's why we just take a moment and behold Him. He is our everything. As I was sharing on Sunday about Ephesians 3, 19, about the fullness of God that dwells inside of us, the fullness of the deity, which dwells bodily in Christ, also dwells in, in us, the fullness of everything. We do not come from a place of lack. Our faith is actually to believe in what we do have, not to believe for, but to believe in what we do have already. And it's not something outside of Christ. It is Christ. So it's that abiding place. We have such confidence that I have everything, the fullness of God inside of me. So in that moment, I turn my eyes and I look and behold Jesus and his presence comes. And it's just a reassurance again of who I am. So that's why there's a fight that goes on about belief and unbelief. Um, because actually it's what Christ has already done in our lives versus us getting something from God. Um, he, we already have it in him and it's now to walk in that. So, so I want to encourage you even about sleep. It's not a place of now we contend for a good night's sleep. It's a place of believing and resting in that we have peaceful sleep because of who we have inside of us. And that I can rest. The more I believe that, the more I will experience and walk in it. Grace comes when we have this truth that now we allow that truth to take root and become a reality in our lives. It's the grace of God. That's why it's not an effort. There is no tree, no fruit tree that you see straining and trying to pop out fruit. Fruit comes naturally. If it's an apple tree, it will produce apples, not because it's been popping them out straining but because it's naturally the source inside of the apple tree produces apples. You and I have the source. Jesus Christ is our source in our lives, and it comes naturally to us to operate in peace. It comes naturally for us to sleep. It came naturally for Christ to lie in the boat and have a good kip because it, he's, he knew that he was at peace. There was no storm going to change that. And so storms might come in our life, but it's natural for us to sleep in the midst of a storm because we, our identity is not found in that storm. We know who Jesus is. So I want to encourage that because that's as from the prophetic voice in the house. Um, James is feeling that about peaceful sleep at these times. Um, it's not the circumstances that need to change. It's us to believe who we are. We can sleep in the midst of storms. Um, I want to encourage you that storms will come. They came to the wise and to the foolish. Same storm came. Um, but the reality was, one, the house got washed away and collapsed. The other one, the house stood through that storm because they understood the word of God and had allowed the word of God to, to change who they were, actually. Um, their identity was found in God. Vital. I, I want to just say this too. Just uh, yesterday on the land, as I was praying, I just felt the Lord remind me of three very key things. One is new creation. Um, we must understand our identity at this time. I feel like the attack in the church is really challenging who we are in God. Um, so it's understanding our identity. And number two is relationship through the Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ. And number three, it's hearing the voice of the Lord. Those three things are absolutely key at this time. It's just going before the Lord, allow, allowing him to, to reinforce those things in our life again. They're all connected. They all work together. You can have a relationship with God uh, much easier when you know your identity in him so the enemy isn't trying to lie to you. You have a clear conscience, not a guilty conscience that you are not worth it or not worthy or he's upset with you or whatever. It's identity is critical. Then a relationship with him, absolutely vital through the Holy Spirit. And as you have a relationship with him, so you'll be able to hear his voice. Another key thing, we've got a lot of people at the moment saying, but I'm betting to hear God's voice. As long as you say that, you still believe that you need to uh, receive something. So your faith is to hear God's voice. Your faith must not be to hear God's voice. You can hear God's voice because you are his sheep and sheep will know the shepherd's voice. It's a place of believing that I can hear, I do hear. And uh, as I rest in him, and declare that over my life in that place of faith that, yes, thank you, Lord, that you're speaking to me. Thank you that I'm hearing you. Thank you for a, a relationship that I have, this close relationship that I have with you. As we begin to declare that, so the Holy Spirit comes, 
and that voice begins to get louder and louder because I'm, I'm exalting him, I'm beholding him, I'm making him bigger in my life by my words as I'm speaking to, to God. I'm sharing with him and I'm saying, God, you're so amazing. You just, you're so much bigger than everything else, Lord God. Like that picture of the chariots of fire that's surrounding, it's, it's, it's declaring that, um, not trying to believe that God's going to rest me out of a situation. I'm safe and secure. The chariots of fire around my life. You're so amazing. You're, I'm in your hand. Nobody can take me out of your hand. I'm secure in you. You have provided every single one of my needs according to your riches. So thank you, Lord. Every need as it arises is met by you. I'm coming from that place of faith now, place of belief. And I have security in that because there's no lack. Then fear cannot come in. Fear cannot come in where there's no lack. Um, so that's what we're contending for. Mm -hmm. And uh, that what Connor was sharing too for me is that's where beholding Jesus is actually all about. It's, it's at times he tries, the enemy tries to distract us by taking our eyes off Jesus onto something else. Uh, and anything else, if it's not on Jesus, is has got lack. Only he is the fullness of God. Only he has everything. So I hope that encourages. I just, I mean, I'm journeying it myself yesterday on the property too, just, just journeying it, um, you know, wrestling with it because I find myself defaulting back to praying for uh, things a lot, you know, and, and, uh, and then I just felt the Lord saying, no, no, um, you don't know your identity, Grant, just reinforce who you are. We are children of God. We are sons and daughters of the living God. We have everything that pertains to life and Godness, like Connor said. And we're adding to our faith all these other beautiful qualities of God. But our faith is in Jesus and his fullness and who he is. So we are, we are, we are, we are, we are the carriers of the presence of the Lord. Um, we have to believe that. Uh, and then tangibly we will reflect that. Can I, can I add something, Con? Is it, is it okay? So, um, Con also gave me a book by Watchman Nee, which is really, really awesome. I'm halfway through um, the communion of the Holy Spirit. And um, what, what has really st struck me about um, the first part of the book is this, you know, is this clear sense of the church being the body of Christ. He is, he is the head and we are his body. And the, and, 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 the, and the sense of oneness of everyone that is on this, on this call here tonight and the whole church of the body of Christ um, that, is, that, that, is, that is one. The same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside the body of Christ individually but more so as a as a body more so as a as a church um and and when con prays the 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 what he was what he was praying it's not just him who's praying it's all of us who are praying we are one body and we are all praying and the power of uh, that raised jesus from the dead comes into that prayer we are all praying when 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 one of us is looking for for um, uh, to to have um, good sleep and to and to walk in the things that God has already given to us. It's not just that one person; it is all of us. We are all together one. There is so we have to guard against it, where the world is today, which is everything is about the individual. And the, there's a strong sense, certainly from the book of of this of this of of a community of family and of who we are one with another with with christ as the head where the resurrection power of god comes in the whole not just in the individual but in the whole and so anybody who's 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 hurting is part of the body the rest of us are hurting too it's one body but the resurrection power that is that is on the inside of that that raised jesus from the dead is on the inside of this body and therefore on the inside of you and every time someone prays something um, from the from from the perspective of abiding in, in in Christ, we are all praying those things, and there there is nothing nothing can stop that.
There is nothing can stop that. Christ is the head and we are his body. We are his body and we, and we carry the resurrection power and, and, and we are one with one another. It's one family. We're all together. There's not, it's not, you know, it's too easy to look at things out, out, uh, as like I have these needs and I have these needs and this person needs, or I want to pray for that person's needs. No, it's one body and we are all feeling and living the same things, but with the resurrection power of Christ that is on the inside of us and, and flowing into each one of those prayers. And it, and it will it'll not return void, ever, ever. So that's just my encouragement. Oof, that's so good. I also just had such a sense. Um, I'm just trying to see. Yeah. I think I can't see. I think Krista's, Krista's gone off. Yeah. Um, I just felt it for her, but I, I think it's for so many of us. Um, I just kept hearing the Lord say um, that you're covered, you know. Um, and, and the picture that I have of covered is not just like, you know, how you got to be hidden or kept away but you're covered with him, like you're in him. Uh, and so like when you understand that, that uh, the abiding, that you're in him, that you're one with him. I love everything that my dad was saying there. Those three things are the, the uh, as he was sharing, it's like those are the fundamentals of what being in Christ actually is on the day-to-day -day level, what that looks like, how it's lived and how it's, how it's walked together. And, and what Gav has just shared now is that actually as a whole bunch of people begin to do that, you're joined and connected into one fellowship, one body. Um, and when we talk about God's heart, then suddenly as a community, our hearts and our, our prayer life and our vision, and our, it's enlarged way beyond an individual life to this beautiful body and bride of, of the Lord's that we're actually a part of, that we're building, that we're serving, that is going to be what we are in for all of eternity. Um, but in that, I just felt the Lord say, you're covered. And uh, you're covered by him. You're covered by one another. And uh, actually to be in Christ and to be in the family of God is the safest and most beautiful place um, to be. And I, I don't even know the fullness of, of what I'm saying there, but I know that over the coming weeks and the coming months, I think the Lord's going to teach us what that looks like, um, what it means to be in him and to be in his body, to belong to his body. I really believe it's one of the safest, most secure places that we can be. And uh, you just have to, to see, it's heartbreaking, but you just have to see people that step out of, of that, out of relationship with the Lord and out of community and family and belonging uh, in his body and, and look at what happens uh, to their lives and, and how it becomes rocky and all over the place. And I believe that that's, that's a very intentional, specific thing, that actually to be in Christ, to be in the body is exactly what you were created and designed for. And by doing that, even just in those simple things, you are already beginning to walk in purpose and destiny um, for your life. So uh, that's exciting for me because it's simple and God does the most profound things through the most simple acts of obedience. And so it's amazing that the attack on the church now was actually to scatter or to uh, uh, bring disunity or separation to the church. But God's using this season to bring true unity and a true oneness mm -hmm. to the body. Amazing. My dad's going to say something that I can see. Go for it. So just another thing that happened on the property, as Gavin and Connor were sharing, that I just, I thought just, it's sometimes good to just change uh, the way we kind of have read things or understood things, just helps us to reinforce something. And, you know, at the end of Ephesians, and we're talking about one body, and we know that Christ is the head, and we're the body, and um, how, you know, obviously he's the head, he's in charge. So in the head, there's the thinking and there's the decision making and, and, and he, we, we all surrender and submit to him. And we understand that picture, but I was just reading the end of Ephesians and it says, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. 
And we know that scripture, but I just felt the Lord emphasize on the property. Um, he said this, and, and he gave him as head over all things to the church. So God gave Jesus, who is head over all things, to the church. Christ is head, not just of the church. He's head over all things. See, he's head over anything you're facing. He's head over any situation, circumstance. He is the head over every single thing. He is, he rules, he reigns over every single thing. God gave Christ to us, the church. It says he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things. Yes. As head. He gave to the church Christ who is head over all things. Not just head of the church, but he is head. He is in charge. He is in control. He is the final authority. He's the king. He's the ruler. He's everything. And he gave him to Christ, to the church. It's mind-blowing to, to have this that revelation understanding of why we can be so secure, so happy, so relaxed, sleep at night, not worry about anything. Because Christ, the gift of Christ was given to me. Christ in me, the hope of glory. I can know that Christ is my gift. He's been given to me and he will take care because he's head over every single thing. He is the final say. So sleep or sleeplessness, you bow because Christ is head over you. And so I can uh, rest easy because Christ is ruling over my sleep. Christ is ruling over my life in every single area. So it just was a, just, a, just like a re-emphasizing a little bit of, I know it's a truth we already know, but I just love that um, as we're one body and Christ is the head and, and, and get a picture of the fullness of, of us as one. Um, I also just felt the Holy Spirit trying to emphasize to me just uh, the authority of Christ in our lives and that God so loved the world that he gave his son. Christ is a gift. Uh, it's incredible to think the Son of God is a gift to us. He entrusted him to us in our lives. Um, and who did he entrust? He entrusted the head over all things into our lives so that we can now establish and put the enemy under our feet because we are now Christ's body. So we, because of Christ, now can walk in this authority that that he's given us. So the more we make Christ big in our lives, the more we walk in authority and power. Sorry, that was another little. So good. Woohoo! <laughs> Okay, I, 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 oh, my mom's going to go for it, mom. No, just one line. And Jesus, the head, is head over heels in love with each and every one of you. Yeah. So mm -hmm. good. I love that. <laughs> so, yeah, I really feel, you know, this is, it's a huge thing and you can keep going and there's, there's so much in it. But I just want to, I don't want to lose this simplicity um, just of what the Lord's releasing and, and ministering um, tonight. And that's actually just that it's okay. You can, you can learn to just pause. You don't have to fix the situation before you can step into abiding. You can actually, in the midst of situations, circumstances, and things that you face, you can pause, behold Jesus, turn your affection towards him, and watch your awareness of God grow. Um, and as you do that, you begin to abide in him, abide in his presence, and he'll produce the fruits of, of his life in and through you. Um, so receive that tonight. So just one more time, if you're comfortable, lift your hands and just receive it. Lord, we just, we ask that you make this so real in our hearts and lives. And I thank you that every word that has been spoken tonight, Lord, I pray that, that it wouldn't just be words and that any words that are, are not of your heart or spirit or, or what you're saying or doing, Lord, that they, they fall away, but that you minister 
through our words tonight, Lord, and that you touch hearts and that you touch lives and that you, you bring us into that place of surrender and yielding where we can abide in you, we can rest in you, we can remain in you with confidence, with faith in what you've already become and are becoming in us. Um, and, I, and I just release that confidence. I release that rest tonight in Jesus' name. So we just say thank you. We never want to take your presence for granted. We are so blessed as the people of God to have you in our lives, filling us, possessing us 24-7, 365, to have your presence in us, upon us, and around us. And I pray tonight for wild encounters, wild, wild, yes. beautiful times you, of encountering Jesus and the great revealing of the Son of God in our hearts and lives. Mm -hmm. And we bless you tonight, Holy Spirit. We enthrone you in our lives. We say thank you for your word. We honor your word. We honor the truth that you've given us, Lord, that governs us as the highest authority in our lives. We say thank you, Lord. We bless you. We love you. We adore you. You are beautiful beyond comparison. So thank you, Holy Spirit. We enjoy you. We receive your life tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.